Hello, my name is Jeff Sharman. I'm the Medical Director of Hematology Research for US Oncology, and I am a practicing oncologist at the Willamette Valley Cancer Center in Eugene, Oregon. Today, I've been asked to present a case uh, of a 79-year-old gentleman with relapsed chronic lymphocytic leukemia to address some of the uh, treatment considerations we have in this patient population. This particular patient um, is a hypothetical patient, but referred to you or referred to me. Uh, we'll say that he was a 79-year-old gentleman who initially presented to his outside medical oncologist for the first time, uh, complaining of some vague intermittent abdominal pain and some uh, progressive fatigue. His past medical history is notable primarily for medically controlled hypertension. He had a myocardial infarction eight years ago and is on uh, low-dose aspirin. His original CLL diagnosis was about seven years ago, and after a period of watchful waiting, uh, he had progressive lymphocytosis and adenopathy, and he was uh, treated with abrutinib, 420 milligrams daily. And his uh, symptoms improved, and he achieved a uh, stable disease with resolution of lymphadenopathy. Unfortunately, after five years of disease control on abrutinib, he complained of uh, increasing fatigue and decreasing appetite. On physical exam, he had a return of palpable lymphadenopathy and his spleen was palpable four centimeters below the costal margin. At that time, seen by an outside medical oncologist, he was started on rituximab monotherapy due to his medical comorbidities. But after six months on this regimen, he uh, presents to your clinic or my clinic uh, after moving to be uh, closer to family. His physical exam was notable at uh, this time for uh, uh, palpable bilateral cervical adenopathy, right-sided inguinal, ad right inguinal adenopathy. Labs showed a white blood cell count of 55,000, predominantly lymphocytes, neutrophil count of 3,100. He was anemic and thrombocytopenic with a hemoglobin of 9.4 and platelets of 90,000 respectively. His beta-2 microglobulin was elevated, and notably, he had a creatinine clearance of just 31 milliliters per minute. Flow cytometry confirmed the typical immunophenotype for CLL, and at this time, FISH testing was performed and importantly returned a deletion of 17P in a high fraction of the cells. He was RI stage 4 uh, with an ECOG performance status of 1. And at this time, uh, treatment was initiated with idelalisib uh, in combination with uh, rituximab, or I should say idelalisib was added to rituximab uh, at this time, 150 milligrams POBID. Now, this is an interesting case, and it presents a number of, of features that are challenging um, in terms of how to pick therapy in this uh, population with significant comorbidities. This is a patient who uh, has high risk CLL. He has relapsed after a brutinib, uh, and he has a deletion of 17P. What that means is that uh, chemoimmunotherapy is not going to work for this individual, uh, so you really don't have that uh, much as the way of options. Uh, and then you've exhausted BTK inhibitors, uh, and so um, there's a question of what you have left. Um, in this particular case, the outside provider used rituximab monotherapy, probably for lack of clarity what options might have been available. But this is a patient, because of his age, because of his comorbidities, um, it's very possible this patient may ultimately pass away of their CLL, which in uh, sort of contemporary CLL management seems like a relatively rare occurrence. So when we discuss risk stratification for patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, there's a couple things that are really important we think about um, their IGHV status, which is really a measurement of how quickly the CLL is, is growing. What are the kinetics of growth? Um, and then we think about the FISH status, which is how resistant it is to therapy. Um, and deletion of 17P is a particularly noteworthy abnormality because patients with 17P uh, simply have very brief responses to chemoimmunity chemoimmunotherapy-based approaches. Similarly, we're seeing in updates with um, targeted therapies such as venetoclax that 17P can retain uh, adverse uh, prognostic significance in this population. And in this particular patient's case, uh, it's, it's idelalisib had been added to, to the regimen, and it's noteworthy that idelalisib outcomes uh, really appeared to be independent of 17P. So whether 17P is 
present or not, uh, the outcomes relative to 17P don't matter quite as much. 